Okay. Um, thank you very much for joining. Um, so in the next 40 minutes, we'll be talking about free and open source software tools for making open source hardware. My name is Leona Navi, and uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Consalco Group. Uh, the company I work for provides consultancy services for hardware bring up of embedded devices. But I'm here to talk about something a little bit different. And uh, it's not just software, it's both software and hardware. The agenda for today uh, spreads in three directions. First, we'll speak about open source hardware. After that, uh, I'll share some experience that I have uh, with free and open source software tools for designing printed circuit boards. As I said, I'm a software engineer, so I do this as a hobby. But I want to do an overview of the tools that we have uh, that are free and open source to do this job. And um, finally, the third direction and the final part of the presentation <coughs> is about making cases uh, with 3D printing s services uh, and using free and open source software CAD. How many of you are familiar with open source hardware as a term? Can you raise your hands? Oh, that's perfect. You are the perfect audience. Uh, just for the record, uh, I have to say that open source hardware is quite similar as open source software. So the idea is to share the design of a physical object that is publicly available so other people can benefit from it. Uh, for example, students can use it to, to educate. Pe pe other people can um, modify the design, even sell it. Um, and the open source All right, so uh, the open source hardware movement is uh, getting some traction in the recent years. When you have a physical project that you would like to share in terms of schematics, uh, in order to make it open source, really open source hardware, you need to pick up a license. Um, it's the same workflow like with open source software, and you can even use some of the um, licenses that are available and popular for software, but since uh, software is different from hardware, I recommend you to pick up a license that covers better um, hardware. Um, I have listed here some of the popular licenses that I have seen in open source hardware projects. Of course, these are just a few of the licenses there. Um, there are a lot of other options. You can even make your own uh, license that fits perfectly for your product. Uh, if you're not sure, just um, have a look at the other open source hardware projects, read the licenses and pick the one that suits you best. Uh, for my case, I prefer the Creative Commons um, open source licenses for hardware products. What are the benefits of open source uh, hardware? The first thing is that it um, gives confidence that the design will be available even if the original manufacturers stop producing the device. Uh, it's a common case in, uh, in the industry that some companies make a product after a decade. Uh, this product is no longer on the market, but there are still systems that are based and using these devices. And uh, this could be a problem uh, for maintaining, um, maintaining a system based on certain hardware devices. With open source hardware, you can be sure that you cannot, uh, you, you will not be in this embarrassing situation when you have a system that's running smoothly, but the hardware is not there on the market, because you, with, if this is an open source hardware, you can make it on your own. The second thing is that open source hardware is putting pressure on the price to be low, because when you're having an open source hardware product, you know the bill of materials, and come on, we are all engineers, we can go and check what's inside, we can see the parts, and that's how we can see if the price is fair. So open source hardware is about making fair prices as well. Another benefit, and this is probably the most important in terms of embedded devices, is that you can customize the hardware, you can make your own devices by getting the original hardware, by contributing your changes, customizing them, on top of what has been already shared. It's all about sharing knowledge, uh, educating people, and getting feedback from the community. For small companies that are making open source hardware, this is really important 
because this is how they can get feedback from high quality engineers and they can improve the product that are they providing to their customers. Who is making open source hardware? I bet you all know these names. And um, speaking about open source hardware, I believe number one should be Arduino. It's um, widely popular, everyone knows it, and um, it was one of the very first embedded boards that became so popular and it's based on open source hardware, which means that anyone can manufacture it. Of course, the Arduino trademark, uh, Arduino is a trademark, so other manufacturers use different names. Um, there is a company in my uh, hometown, Olimex, which are also making a lot of open source hardware, of course, SparkFun, Adafruit, even big corporations like Intel, Google, and IBM nowadays release some of their products, hardware products, under open source hardware licenses. Um, there are a lot of examples about open source hardware. I have selected just a few of them. So let's start with Arduino. As I said, uh, this is the bright example for uh, open source hardware. Everyone knows it. From students to professionals, we all love Arduino. Um, Mino board is, um, is a product uh, which uh, is with Intel Atom CPU. It's a very powerful single board computer that is entirely open source hardware. There are a few versions of Mino board over the years. This is the last one, uh, Mino board Turbo. Before that, uh, we had Mino board Max and the original Mino board. I bet you have all seen this. And um, Google released the cardboards in, in order to make virtual reality more popular, and they shared um, the design of this physical object, so anyone can do it. You can buy a pizza, grab the cardboard, uh, cardboard and out of it you can make, make a uh, Google Cardboard for virtual reality. This is a fine example how big companies are also joining the open source hardware movement. Another example like this is the IBM TJ bot. This was released um, actually this year, and this is a friendly robot that you can build, put on your desk, and uh, talk with it for s serving some simple tasks. Um, Olimax Terrace One is a do-it-yourself laptop. Olimax is a company based in Bulgaria. I'm coming uh, also from Bulgaria. Uh, their headquarters is in my hometown. And um, the day before yesterday, on Saturday, they released it on the market. We had a workshop, and it was amazing because just in about 90 minutes, everyone was able to make with his bare hands to assemble a laptop that is open source hardware. Uh, it was a f fantastic experience. And um, since we are in, in, uh, in the Czech Republic, my last example that should inspire you how great is open source hardware is about the 3D printers. Have you heard them? Okay. Okay. All right. So yes, uh, a person on the first row said that he even has a, a, a this uh, printer in his office, one of these printers. So this is a 3D printer that is open source. It's capable of making open source hardware as well. Isn't that great? Um, so how to make a really entirely open source device? Um, open source software has been here for decades. We are all very well familiar with free and open source software. But speaking about open source hardware and putting things together, both open source hardware and open source software, is something a little bit newer. Um, so for an embedded devi device in terms of, uh, since we are at Embedded Linux Conference, uh, apart from the open source software stack, we need an open source hardware. The heart of the hardware is the printed circuit board. And um, we need a case. So making the case is actually the most difficult part based on my experience. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, um, uh, it's time consuming to make it. You need a few attempts. And it's not that easy to, to, uh, to produce. A, it, it wasn't that easy to produce a plastic case for quite some time. But now we have this very affordable 3D printer, so anyone can build a case. So the question that is the core of this presentation is, is it worth designing open source hardware products with expensive proprietary software tools? Is it worth paying 
thousands of US dollars for licensing the software that we use to make open source hardware. Let's have a look at some of the options that we have for this software for making printed circuit boards. Ego, this is probably one of the most popular among hobbies that is not open source. It's very popular because it has, um, uh, it, it has a free license for small two-layer uh, printed circuit boards with some limitations uh, of the size. Uh, it's also free for students, but it has a paid subscription. And um, not that far ago, I think it was in the beginning of this year, it was bought by Adobe. Altium, it was formerly known at Proto, probably a hardware engineer would recommend you um, wor uh, using Altium, it, but the problem is that it's a very expensive tool. Of course, it's a very good tool as well. Other popular tools are, such as Orcad or SolidWorks Electrical also require high fees. So I forgot to ask you, by the way, how many of you are hardware engineers? Okay, and how many of you are software engineers? Making software. Okay, we have a few hardware engineers, the majority is software. I'm also a software engineer, so take whatever I say about hardware with a pinch of salt, because you know I'm so just a software guy. And speaking about tools for making hardware, it's, it's kind of a religion. If someone is used to using Autium, um, I don't expect him to switch to uh, free and open source too. But if you are designing a new product, you want to try something new, or even if you don't have any experience with any of these software, go for a free and open source option. So what we have on the market as of today, that's free and open source software. There are a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, suits for designing uh, printed circuit boards. Uh, these three are among the most popular, according to my knowledge. Um, I have listed them in order of difficulty. So the easiest one is Fritzing. After that, we have Jida. I'm not exactly sure about the pronunci pronunciation, although I tried it. And finally, we have uh, KiCad in this list. Let's have a look with a little bit of details of each of these applications. So Fritzing, it's, it's made for kids. It's really simple. It's free and open source software available under the GPL version 3 license. It's cross-platform, it works on Linux, it works on Windows, it works on Mac. Uh, it's um, widely used uh, by the community for making sketches, and this is the, the main purpose. Uh, but you can also uh, design single layer, very simple single layer printed circuit boards. It's written in C++ with Qt, the source code is in GitHub. Um, so if you want to contribute something, just go to GitHub and create um, GitHub pull request. The fact that it uses the Qt framework makes it um, cross-platform. So this is how it looks. Really convenient for making a small tutorial or, uh, or even not that small when you need to, to make a simple sketch. Now, um, the next project is called Jita. Uh, I'm not personally using this one, but I did um, a bit of a research regarding it. It's a um, quite old project, actually. It's again free and open source software, again GPL, but this time version 2. Uh, it also works on Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. For me, it's really important for a, for a software to work on my machine, and I'm a Linux user, as you can guess. So cross-platform is something that I look every time when I uh, select uh, a tool to use. It supports, uh, it's a professional tool. It supports uh, printed circuit boards with multiple layers. It's written uh, with uh, GTK, and the source code is again in Git repositories. And now we're coming to my personal favorites, that what I'm using for designing my hobby open source hardware devices. It's called KiCad. It has a long history with more than 20 years. It's free and open source software under GPL version 3 license. Again, cross-platform, works anywhere. It supports PCB with multiple layers, uh, no limitations of the site. It has a nice integration of 3D viewer, so we can even preview the board that you are designing. Uh, the contributions for the development of KiCad are coming from uh, CERN, uh, CERN, and um, it's uh, been a very uh, rapid development in KiCad in the past uh, couple of years. It's already well adopted by the industry. 
Uh, the company Olimax that I've mentioned in one of the previous slides used KiCad to design their laptop. So the printed circuit boards, which are highly complex within this do-it-yourself laptop, are designed using KiCad, which is a um, fun example that KiCad is capable of handling not only hobby projects, but professional uh, projects that involve uh, printed circuit boards on a lot of layers. It's written in C++, the source code is in Git repositories. Uh, so this is how the PCB view of KiCad looks like. So basically the process is that you first do the schematics, after that you select the footprints, and you go to the PCB view where you place some components. This is an open source hardware add-on board for Raspberry Pi that I have designed in my spare time. And this is just um, how KiCad looks when you use it. It's, um, it's uh, I, w I, I would say it's uh, not that complex and user friendly. You, you, need, uh, you need to spend some time researching the documentation and probably in a few days um, you feel like home using KiCad. While I was preparing the slides for this presentation, I found another tool for designing CAD software. Um, it's an online tool that really impressed me. It's um, called Mew, uh, MeowCAD or something like that. I'm not good with pronunciation, sorry about that. So it's an online tool that you can run wi within your web browser and you can make a printed cir uh, circuit board. Again, it's a free and open source software tool. It's written primarily in Java, since we're talking something that's, uh, sorry, in JavaScript, Python, and Go. Uh, that's kind of normal, since we're speaking about something that runs in your web browser, and of course, a backend in the cloud. The source code is in GitHub. Um, it's, it's kind of basic, but it was really fun trying out this, this thing. Uh, the project is, um, is still live, although the contributions in 2017 that I spotted were a little bit less compared to what I saw in the previous years. But um, if you have some spare time, have a look at this, it's fun. So a few recommendations if you are designing a um, uh, printed circuit board. How many of you have designed a printed circuit board? All right. Um, I'm just sh sharing some of the experience that I have. Uh, as I said, as a software engineer at the beginning, I had a lot of failures making printed circuit boards, you can guess. and. Um, um, the few things that <laughs> I would recommend any one of you to follow is first to, to go to the manufacturer of the PCB that you, you prefer to work with and um, to check their minimum requirements for tray spaces, drills, and angular rings. This could uh, save you a lot of times, time and a lot of failures. Unlike the software, when you're making a hardware, you first have to to design something, after that you have to manufacture it. It's not like pressing a run button and just uh, doing a QA tests. With hardware, it's a little bit diff different. Uh, keep in mind the complexity of the assembly process while designing the PCBs. I have done a few failures because of this. Sometimes the design is valid, it works. Um, you can assemble it once, but actually the assembly process could take too much time. So when you're designing the, the board, um, keep in mind how to make the, the assembly process easier. Um, finally, uh, it's about, about the case. As I said, it based on my experience, making a plastic case or whatever kind of a case is the most difficult part of making an open source, entirely open source project. So um, I would recommend considering the design of the, um, of the case while making the printed circuit board. Um, it's a little bit hard to do it this way, but still keep in mind because final the final product is uh, w w should be for users and users like even not not even not only users even developers. We all love to have uh, not a bare printed circuit board. We love to have a device in a nice case. So um, the question is where to print a prototype when you have a printed circuit board schematics. Um, I'm personally using, I have uh, personally tried all these options. The first option is um, a really nice website called OSH Park. They're providing, providing services for making prototypes for two layer and four layer boards at very affordable prices and very good quality. Um, the process is super simple. They have instructions how to export Gerber files and Drill files and to upload them to their website. They have one big button on their website where you just press 
upload your designs and in a few seconds you will see um, an image of your board that you can um, uh, review. Um, th the process is really simple because you don't have to select all the annoying options. They just um, have pre-selected all options for you to make a high quality board and they have a purple color. That's, uh, that's the trick. Of course, uh, if you have a local factory nearby you, you can, have, uh, you can go there and use it. In Europe, uh, there are a lot of fact factories that are uh, like this. Um, I live in um, not that big city, and um, we have like two factories providing services for making print circuit board. Yes? Okay. S yeah, I'll just repeat the question. So the question is, since I'm um, since I'm based in Bulgaria, are the prices um, um, uh, competitive compared to, to the Chinese prices? So the answer is no. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, uh, just give me a second. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, using local factories, of course, uh, making uh, production in China is always cheaper. We all know that they're, um, they have a huge experience in manufacturing. Uh, but if you make just a, a prototype, uh, making in uh, Europe, especially in Bulgaria, uh, the price is not that higher, and uh, for me, I prefer to make them locally because it saves, uh, saves me time for, uh, for the transportation. Because if I, I, if I use OSH Park, they have a really fast delivery, but still it takes a few days. Same goes for China. While with a local, uh, with a local factory, I can visit uh, the factory and uh, directly get the prototype. Uh, so the... Um, the difference here is uh, it depends on uh, uh, what kind of a project um, are you asking for. Because if you are speaking about a complex board that involves like uh, f uh, six or eight layers, uh, there are not so many co companies that can uh, manufacture such kind of a board. And then probably you need to go to, to a Chinese manufacturer and, and you won't have uh, that much of a uh, options. But if, you, if you're designing a two-layer board or a four-layer board, yeah, um, Making them in Europe is fine. So um, now uh, we are entering the next stage of the presentation. It's about the 3D CAD software for um, making physical objects like cases. Um, I have selected some uh, free and open source software tools, which I believe are popular for uh, designing a 3D object that can be after that 3D printed. So the list here includes OpenSCAD, QCAD, FreeCAD, and Blender. Uh, in the next slides, we'll see with a little bit more details um, each of these software. Um, is any one of you using them? Can you? Oh, okay. Let's um, let's uh, have a look at each of them. Uh, so OpenSCAD, this is my personal favorites, and I believe every developer should love this project because it's really simple. On the one side of the screen, you write code, on the other side, you see a physical object. Isn't that gorgeous? Of course, designers hate it. Uh, so, it's a free and open source software. Uh, it's script only. The only option is to write a script, no other options. Uh, it's available under GPL version 2 license. Again, it's cross-platform compatible, works on your Linux distribution, on Windows or Mac OS X. Um, the fact that it's cross-platform uh, is because it's based on the Qt framework again, it's written in C++, and the source code is in GitHub, so you know how to contribute code if you find a bug or something. This is how it looks. So here is how you write code. It has uh, its own scripting language. Uh, so, uh, well, you have to mind the, the learning curve. At the beginning, you have to put some efforts to, to learn the scripting language, but uh, it's straightforward, in my opinion, and especially for making simple cases like this one here, uh, you can learn the script quite fast and make something. Of course, um, this process of making um, cut objects, physical objects using scripting language, uh, is appropriate for more simpler uh, pro um, objects. If you have, if you want to make a very sophisticated case. It might be a little bit difficult with OpenSCAD. So there are other free and open source software tools that you can consider. Let's have a look at them. QCAD is one of them. It's a um, two-dimensional CAD software, again free and open source software, again written in C++ with Qt, 
and again works on multiple platforms. FreeCAD is one of the most popular free and open source softwares because it combines uh, both words. You have the, the, the option to, to design based on open cascade to design visually and it also works um, everywhere. It's uh, again uh, cross-platform compatible. You can see the, the recurring pattern that it's written in C++ and Python with the Qt framework, uh, the source code again in GitHub. Um, so how many of you are using FreeCAD? One? Okay, just a few of you. So it's more difficult than, it's more difficult uh, than OpenSCAD, but it's uh, easier than Blender, the next thing that, w that we're gonna see, and it's uh, made specially for um, 3D printed, uh, for sorry, for uh, 3D objects that you, after that you can print. Blender is not exactly for, uh, it's not exactly a regular CAD software. Actually, it's not a CAD software at all. It's a professional 3D uh, computer graphics suit that is used, used, widely used for making animation movies. I'm pretty sure you have all seen the Big Buck uh, movie with this uh, giant uh, white rabbit. It's very popular in the embedded world. Uh, people make visual effects with Blender, but you can also make 3D models, export them to STL files, and 3D print them. Again, it's a free and open source software tools, uh, free and open source software, um, under available under GPL version 2 license. It, it's cross-platform. It's written in C, C++, Python, using OpenGL. And of course, again, the source in Git. So when you have a 3D object already designed, you have to export um, you have to export a file called STL, and out of this STL file, in order to 3D print it, you have to, to convert the STL to a file called G-code, which is um, specifically set for the printer that you have in. Because different print printers have different settings, uh, of course, it depends on the material and so on. So Udimaker, the famous manufacturer of 3D printers, has made a free and open source software tool called Udimaker Cura, which is a software for slicing and preparing um, STL files for printing. It supports not only Udimaker 3D printers, but many more, and um, it's probably one of the most popular uh, or the most popular open source solution for this job. Again, it's a free and open source software uh, under uh, it's available under the, uh, the, uh, the lesser uh, GPL license version 3 cross-platform so you can use it on any popular uh, distribution that you have for a desktop it could be a Linux distribution it could be Windows it could be Mac OS isn't that great uh, all of these free open source software tools that we are reviewing in this presentation uh, support uh, multiple platforms Ultimaker is uh, written in Python and QML and the source code is in GitHub this is how it looks. Actually, the screenshot that I took is a little bit um, older because uh, I received an email last week from Ultimaker that they released the third version of the software, but this is um, a little bit older version, I think. This is 2.5, but you get the idea. Once you have an STL file, you import this STL file, you see something like this. I have a very basic printer, so here is the dimensions that my printer can um, can print, and uh, I have to um, to put the the object that I want to print uh, in a way to fit the dimensions of, of the, su the supported dimensions by the printer. Okay, so we're uh, we're coming to the end of the presentation, and uh, I would like to uh, come up with a few conclusions. So. Um, in this presentation, we briefly went through some of the, not all of them, but some of the free and open source software tools available for making open source hardware. And I hope that um, I managed to convince you that open source hardware um, is a viable business, uh, business model. And furthermore, there are enough free and open source software tools to make open source hardware because uh, it's valuable not only to share the schematics of the free open uh, free open source hardware. Uh, sorry, it's not it's not valuable only to share the the, sch the schematics of a hardware product under open source license, but it's also viable uh, valuable 
to share it in a way that other people can easily contribute and use this product. And one more thing, no matter if you're making software or hardware, share it under open source license. So thank you very much and uh, we have like five minutes for questions. Any questions? works uh, yeah. uh, so I uh, have a question regarding flights in there uh, if you maybe know uh, in uh, Linux world uh, there is some thing that happened at recently named uh, copyright trolls so how can I make sure that uh, if you release it your uh, hardware under some open source license that you will not try to take some money from me and which license it's better to use in order to prevent this issue? Okay, well, it's a tricky question, and uh, as, um, as an engineer, I'm not sure I can provide you the exact answer, because this, uh, uh, this involves uh, a, a lot of knowledge about uh, woes and uh, wares, so pff, it's, a, it's a hard question for me to answer. Directly. So uh, what usually you uh, use which license? Uh, well, I prefer to publish the things I do and to reuse open source hardware er, uh, under Creative Commons. Mm. Okay, thank you. But of course, Creative Commons have uh, different versions, so pay attention to the version and read carefully uh, the, the license. If you're not sure, um, take some time to speak with a lawyer that can provide you um, exact information. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Another question on the back. So as a software engineer like yourself, I played around with Fritzing and Keycad and a few of the others. And I know that a lot of hardware designers among you um, like to roll your own footprints. Um, at least that's what I've been told. Um, I found things like Fritzing are really good. There's a lot there already. Uh, but it's very limited and when you want to step up going to something like KiCad, I don't know whether you found it but I found it extremely difficult to find the footprints of stuff that I wanted already and obviously as a hobbyist in my spare time with this it takes a lot of time have you how, how did you find that did you find that easy hard or was that a, a major pain point for you uh, yeah excellent question bullseye <laughs> so making the, f the footprints is really important part of making of the hardware it's uh, because uh, it's part of the assembly. Once you do a printed circuit board, it could work, but if the footprints are not exact, th this could um, um, bring a lot of uh, pain during the manufacturing process, uh, even if, uh, if you're doing a small volume manufacturing. Uh, yes, Fritzing is good for making schematics. It's I don't find it very useful for making a printed circuit board since it supports just a single layer board, o although there are some services or making from Fritzing to something more complicated. But I personally use KiCad for making uh, two-layer boards. And um, KiCad offers um, a built-in library with some footprints. But honestly, if you have to, to build a high-quality product, it's better to pick up the components, especially speaking about the SMD components, uh, the surface mounting uh, components that require surface mount technology. Um, so pick up the components, have a look at the data sheet. At the, bottom page, uh, at the last pages of the data sheet, there are exact dimensions, physical dimensions of the components. And based on these physical dimensions, it's a good either to check the libraries if you're using ready libraries or to make your own footprints. Uh, this could save you a lot of time. I, I, I made this mistake to use um, uh, some libraries uh, that I found in GitHub for a certain SMD component. Of course, it works, it's fine but uh, for uh, prototyping, but after that, uh, I had some problems with the SMT assembly. Yeah. Um, so maybe I would like to, to add information to that. So Kika does not only ship some, some libraries with it, but they're working on an open, open library that you can use with your key card. So if you're stuck on footprints that do not really work, just fix them in their GitHub uh, library, and then we're not only having an open source tool, but we're also having an open source library that we can really use in that. 
and I guess then we can benefit from all that open source um, uh, yeah, things that, that come out there. Yes, uh, that's exactly. Thank you very much for the additional information. Uh, sorry if I might mislead you. Uh, it's not that the, the, the components in the library do doesn't work. All of them work and they're fine, but sometimes there might be slight differences. And one important thing that I have to add is that certain companies are sharing the libraries that they're using to design their own products. For example, Olimax shared the libraries that they did for their products because they're using KiCad, but they're making their own footprints for each component that they're using, and they published all these libraries in GitHub um, a few months ago. Okay, one question over there. I missed uh, first few minutes of your presentation. Maybe you already discussed that. Uh, you talked about 3D printing of cases. What about 3D printing of PCBs? Oh, okay. Uh, 3D printing ab about PCBs? I've never tried that. Uh, the, uh, the my process of doing a print circuit board after doing the design is just to go to the factory. At the beginning I mentioned that I'm a software engineer, so the whole thing with hardware is uh, more like a hobby for me, and it's really great experience, but uh, as soon as I have to get from a prototype to a real printed circuit board, I prefer to leave this to the professional companies that are providing it as a service. Have you tried uh, making uh, 3D printed circuit boards? I didn't do myself, but that I'm interested in this technology because of some, you know, flexible PCBs or something like that, or chips inside, some plastic or whatever. You don't need uh, to have them separate uh, file for case. You could create device as a whole. This is interesting, but unfortunately I, I can provide. May I jump this question from my practical experience, Tamogemon holding case. We have a mill. We do it with milling for two dimensional, also for two layer PCBs. But it's already a nuisance getting the through context done. When it gets to four layer PCBs, doing it in house is completely crazy. If you don't have at least 10 million budget, it's just crazy. But generally my experience is just get yourself a reliable vendor in China kick them until they have a three-day turnaround and do that. <laughs> it, it's not worth it. We bought the mill because my uh, wife is a mechanics freak and she uses it for mechanical assembly. We milled two PCBs and after that the whole company we got together and we said fuck this shit, we're never doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, just another question over there. Yes, you, you, you said that uh, MSMD mounting, I mean, uh, after you make the PCB, you have to assemble the components. Yes. Uh, I'd love to make like uh, a board with uh, SMD LEDs, but how? <laughs> I mean, I, I can't do that myself. But uh, de uh, depends on the size of the SMD. If you're doing like uh, with sizes uh, 0805 or 0603, uh, you can do it with a soldering iron. You just need to practice a little bit. Okay. Uh, YouTube can come to the rescue. Uh, but uh, the other option is uh, to go to a factory that does not only the PCB, but also the assembly process. Any recommendations? I beg your pardon? Any recommendation? Uh, it's sad that Osh, Osh Park doesn't seem to do that. There is another company called OSH Stencil that can make a stencil for you. After that, you can place the paste and f uh, put it in a an oven. Uh, I highly <coughs> recommend you not to use uh, your kitchen oven. <laughs> okay, yep. 06, 03 is easy to do by hand if you have a Mantis microscope. That's what we use in the company, a vision Mantis inspection microscope. And then it's really easy to do by hand. The trick is you tin one pin and then you put the component down and then you tack another pin and just solder them down. It's it's not particularly difficult. I mean, in my company, everybody can do it. Even the 55-year-old the uh, advertising lady already took a shot and she got it working. After 15 or 20 minutes, she was able to reliably solder them. The thing is two things. Number one, you must fuck the EU by leaded solder. No ROHS shit. 
and number two use colophonium, and number three they use an Ursa or another high quality soldering iron. If it costs less than 200 bucks, it's not suitable. Sorry for jumping into your answer. No problem. Thank you very much for the addition. Uh, I'm afraid we're, uh, um, we're a little bit late. So thank you very much for joining. If you have more questions, I'm around. You can come and ask. Thank you very much for joining.